You have Googled yourself at some point or another, admit it. There's nothing shameful about it. It's not worse than what I did. I searched my name on the dark web. Don't ever make that same mistake. I was 19 years old then. Liv, my girlfriend, and her family were kind enough to let me live in their guest bedroom at the start of that year. They liked the fact that I could fix most of their computer problems. Liv is a great person and what she saw in a hacker who could never survive for long in a 9 to 5 world is beyond me. Their house was in a suburb only a few blocks away from a library and coffee shop with free Wi-Fi. These locations were convenient for my burgeoning career as a digital outlaw. I used those resources until I was able to move out and get a small apartment of my own. After a string of demeaning jobs and abusive bosses, I found financial independence. I did this after I learned how to buy and sell things I shouldn't have with the use of my Tor browser. I engaged in illegal transactions such as ordering counterfeit money and stolen IDs. I discovered there was a large market for manufactured psychedelics. I often went to the skate park to sell those items off the nethermost landscape of the World Wide Web. Business was good. A young man with years spent in foster care, I sought out activities which gave me a sense of control. A childhood of not having any will do that to you. The ability to navigate the online world to get almost whatever I wanted afforded me a sense of power. It was all going well until one evening in July. I sat on the second level of a Barnes & Noble bookstore in a corner next to the self-help section. I always did my best work there. The place was starting to go under and I didn't have to worry about an influx of patrons. Despite having a distinguished IP address, I never wanted to risk a raid at home. The items were always shipped to a P.O. box instead of my unit number as well. In retrospect, these were all flimsy safety measures. They still gave me a sense of comfort, even if they were a tad delusional. I made sure there weren't any cameras mounted near where I sat. It was a small place out of the way of the general public. Hiding in plain sight was always my preferred method. I drank strong coffee out of an oversized styrofoam cup. After 15 minutes of searching, I grew bored. I typed in my name, Joshua Wells. An input of my identity on that part of the web should be an indicator of how successful and arrogant I had become. I did not expect Wikipedia to be among the results, but it was the third link down. The first one involved a ghost tour in New Jersey. The guide had a similar name. The second was a gore website I was not interested in. While I may have been a thrill seeker, I was not out to consume media which capitalized on hurting others. I clicked on the third article link because of the title. It was about a television show. It read, The Short Life of Joshua Wells. At first, the title did not startle me, since there are plenty of others with the same name. Recaps of 10 episodes were on the page. The first paragraph illustrated how the series did not continue past season 1. I read the summary of the first episode for the sake of passing time. Episode 1, Joshua's father is a known and feared gang member. His mother is a helpless addict. She attempts to use their own son as a drug mule on a plane flight from Boston to California. She has hopes of making profit by dealing narcotics to a major criminal enterprise on landing. The authorities intercept them, their son goes with CPS. He goes to a safe harbor for kids. The synopsis struck me very close to home. Who wrote or directed the show was not listed, but it did state the air date. 
The month and year given match the era when an identical set of circumstances had befallen me. The name of the center I went to was even called Safe Harbor. I was too young to remember much, but the facts were precise. I gulped and tried to shrug it off as an unusual coincidence. I read the second episode summary. Episode 2, we follow Joshua on his 15th birthday. He goes to a juvenile detention facility for the first time after he attacks a teacher by throwing a desk at him. Although he missed, the instructor still presses charges since he didn't like the student much. He befriended a troublemaker on the inside named Ian. They escape, but not before a massive brawl with the other teens ensue inside of the facility. It ends with the two captured. I felt the hair on my arms stand up. It was uncanny to me how similar the events were to my own experiences. A slight dizziness overtook me, but I went on to the third, unable to keep my eyes from skimming. Episode 3, Joshua is free. Joshua decides to break and enter an old man's upper class home after scouting the place for days. His goal is to take the many Rolex watches from the top drawer of the old man's dresser. When he enters the house, Joshua discovers how the owner did not take his vacation cruise trip as planned. The man was asleep in his bedroom until Joshua wakes the victim by accident. Joshua runs away. He gets chased by the homeowner outside, where the elderly male dies of a heart attack in the street. I felt my chest tighten. It was all true, but I had never shared that story with anyone before. It was one of my most guilt-ridden memories. I read the next two. Episode 4, Joshua has nightmares of the old man crawling out of a ditch and choking him to death. He complains about night terrors to one of his counselors, who recommends a doctor. He ends up selling anti-anxiety pills after he doesn't like the way they make him feel. A girl he asks out overdoses and goes to the hospital. While she survives, he feels terrible, but not enough to stop dealing. He takes his earnings and buys a PC. He takes lessons on how to breach other people's privacy from a group of credit card thieves he met in a mall. Episode 5, Joshua discovers the dark web. He uses it to hustle low-end street drugs at first. He later reads headlines about some of his accomplices getting arrested. He still continues to engage in illicit activity. I looked at the air date for episode 6. It was the 24-hour period I was living through. Episode 6. Joshua goes into a bookstore to poach their internet and try to make some money. He doesn't realize there's a man with a shaved head and a Carhartt t-shirt below him perusing the sci-fi aisle. The stranger is actually an undercover FBI agent. The government worker has a microphone and camera attached beneath his shirt. He is surveying for the perpetrator even though he has not singled out who he is looking for yet. An arrest commences where they tackle Punch and taser Joshua. They place him in handcuffs. My hand shook. I stood gripped an Eckhart Tolle volume to appear less conspicuous and opened it. I leaned my head over the railing to stare at the ground floor below me. A man who matched the description given by the article was there. His shirt was baggy and hid what I knew to be a gun on his hip. He held a paper back in his hands. I pulled out my phone. I pretended to have a conversation with an imaginary business associate about stocks. I folded the laptop with my free hand and went down the escalator. I strolled towards the back where there were stacks of hardcover tomes on history. I followed an unsecured door and walked through it. I was in the warehouse. Unopened boxes were stacked all around. I did not spot any workers and made a run for the rear entrance. 
I sprinted down a wide alleyway between the building and rows of motels. I passed an art gallery and liquor store before my heartbeat slowed. Along the way, I found a closed vegan restaurant called Balenti's Eatery. The place was black on the inside, but its neon sign still glowed. A picnic table sat on the lawn out front. I stationed myself there. I opened the laptop again and connected to their free Wi-Fi without issue. I scanned the rest of the chronology. The remaining episodes were all future time periods. I wiped the perspiration away from my forehead as I read the rundown of the next episode. Episode 7 Labeled a dark net market operator in the media. Three of the seven charges thrown at him led to convictions. This includes conspiracy to traffic narcotics. He gets out early after he agrees to cooperate with different agencies. He becomes a consultant for cybersecurity awareness and a social engineering expert. Following a keynote speech given out of town, he comes home. His girlfriend Olivia and her family have been murdered. My eyes strained and I felt my breath grow shallower. Episode 8 Joshua navigates her house. The walls have dried blood. Every corner's vandalized. Olivia's throat is slit. Her body is over the couch in the living area. Her parents had socks stuffed in their mouth and deep stab wounds on their stomachs. Joshua calls the police. He is treated as the number one suspect in the media for days on end. He is finally cleared, but the psychological damage is too much to bear. I pondered the words, though I was still young. It is true that Liv meant everything to me. Episode 9 Joshua goes to a psychiatric ward. He stares at the padded walls as though they will converse with him. Detectives do visit him with the hopes of gleaning some kind of further information. They tell him they know the aftermath of the massacre he stumbled upon was the work of an active serial killer. The murderer has remained unidentified. Episode 10 Joshua leaps out the window. He breaks his ankle. An adrenaline dump allows him to move across the field and onto the nearest highway. He goes out into traffic. A long-haul truck careens around him and takes out a line of vehicles. He goes to the nearest lake where he weighs his own pockets down with stones. He waits until nightfall and walks out into the abyss. The last image we see is his hand breaking the surface of the water. Starlight glints on his skin before his fingers submerge below the surface. His last few swallows of water create pockets of bubbles which rise to the top. I absorbed what the rest of my existence would look like. Four black SUVs pulled up and circled around me in the parking lot. Men in black suits and the undercover agent from the bookstore ran at me. Even though I did not resist, they still threw me to the ground. They dislocated my shoulder and kicked me in the jaw a handful of times before they cuffed me. I did get time reduced in prison after I agreed to cooperate to catch people like me. After my release date, I have tried to revisit that link without luck. I fail to understand how that article existed in the first place. I have read how high-level stress can open up insights and portals into the unknown. I would bank on the latter, though sometimes I think it isn't for me to know. I do not want to give in to what destiny has written for me. My escape from the bookstore has given me the confidence that I can change the outcome of the dark web's prophecy, even if only for a little while. Or did I only extend the inevitable for a fraction of time? Fate? especially in regards to our stories as individuals, is not written in stone. It is malleable, I tell myself. This positive thought is the only thing which keeps me going.
I should visit Liv's house now. She has not answered my texts all morning.